would just like to say thank you for inviting me here, Stephen, and also Joni Carroll recommended me. I want to recognize and acknowledge that we are on First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada that are the traditional stewards of this land. This sea space is located within Treaty 7 territory, traditional territories, and home of the Stony Nakoda, the Blackfoot, the Susina, and Zone 3 Métis. And together with the settlers of this land, we are all treaty people. Oh. <laughs> OK. Um, and for me, my ancestry is French settlers. So bonjour. Uh, it's kind of the extent of my French, I'm sorry to say. High school French. Uh, they were lumberjacks in the Ottawa River Valley. And when the trees disappeared, they moved to Saskatchewan, which incidentally, there are no trees. So they, uh, they were given an acre um, each, and they became grain farmers in the Depression. Uh, they didn't get rich. They don't have land anymore. But uh, my mother's mother owned a cafe. In, uh, she gave away more food than she actually sold. So she was not very successful at business, but was a favorite in the town of Gravelberg in Saskatchewan. Uh, it may also be useful for you to know that I married way too young. I was single parenting two uh, daughters at 24 years old. And it was while I was on welfare, that trying to get an education, that I became politicized and three decades later has me standing here with you today. So it's actually 30 years, not 20. Um, I need to update my website. Um, um, you saw the spiral there. It's a really important image for me because the things I was doing 30 years ago, I feel like I'm still doing them, but they're all getting better and Calgary's a little more receptive some, to some of the ideas that I have put forward. I've been asked to talk about compassion today. Um, for me, the important word in that is passion, um, because I think everything that is done with passion builds compassion. I'm going to be speaking today from my personal history. I've been engaged in community um, development work in Calgary since the 1980s, and that's working within the Calgary corporate culture. I worked at an organization called Syntax Art Society, which was um, on the corner of 10th Street and Memorial Drive. That was in the mid-80s. And we tried to stop the LRT from going between Sun uh, Sunnyside and Hillhurst. We used art and artful ways to be active and mobilizing the community to try to stop that. Clearly, we weren't successful. Um, but we built um, relationships with the city while we were doing that. Even though we were opposing what they had to do, um, we built relationships. So in 1988, during the Olympics, I worked on the Bridge of Fire. Some of you might have been around then, but this is 14th Street Bridge and Syntax Art Society put that on. So we closed the bridge during the Olympics. 5,000 people were on the sides of the river uh, watching the fireworks. And this is Brian Dyson, who ran Syntax, who I worked for. Um, and he, this is a cartoon of him trying to blow up this, the LRT bridge. <laughs> so it, this is an example to me of how you need to build currency uh, with your relationships in the city. I left a job in the oil patch to go work in the arts. So that's one of the reasons why I wear this um, outfit. So you'll see that on the back, every now and then I'll turn around. This is my media art I wear on my back. But art is also a collaborative process. So if this gets stalled, I might need you to come and press a button for me, uh, things like that. So it's, it's about collaboration. And you have to have compassion for me as I work through technology. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I did, that was a um, Ross Kerr uh, fence painting where I organized a whole bunch of students uh, from ACAD and the two community schools and the senior citizens to paint the hoarding along the fence. That was in 1989, and now everybody does it. I'm not saying I started it, but maybe I did. Uh, in uh, 1991, I got my first grant from the Canada Council, and uh, this is called Video Graffiti. So you'll see here, this is a newspaper box that I've remodeled and put in a VCR VHS machine. <laughs> okay. And I had to find electricity on the street because, you know, everything was run on power back then. So, well, it still is now. But um, so we, we wanted to have a commentary about the mainstream media. So that's one of the projects. Jump ahead to 2009. I worked on an uh, organization called ID Collective. There was three of us. And we used art to explore how people self-identify. We we're also really curious about, the, as the world is more connected to the internet, and we often sit at home in our living rooms connecting with people, it's not as much, we don't do as much of this. So I congratulate 
uh, creative mornings for bringing people together face to face. Um, so ID Collective, we went on the streets and we, uh, people took pictures of themselves and uh, we made a button out of instantly, like we printed it and then they put a button on themselves and then I took a picture of them and the whole time they were telling us how they self-identified. So it's kind of a convoluted way to do an interview. Uh, this project here I was really proud of because there's not very many uh, toilet, public toilets in Calgary. Even for tourists, I don't know if you've ever had friends come to visit, it's really hard to find a public toilet here. So myself and Jane Grace organized a Finding the Peace spot, and I stood in the middle of 8th Avenue Mall, blew a whistle, and said, hello, hello, my name's Sharon Stevens, follow me if you have to pee. Uh, <laughs> and and we, we graded the toilets, things like that. So you'll see that a lot of the work I do requires a costume, and it also requires humor. So um, in 2009, when it was the year of the ox, a lot of my peers were leaving Calgary, a lot of the arts community were fed up with Calgary. <laughs> Goes in cycles, I think. Um, and so I created this project called OX, a crash course on loving Calgary. This again is 2009, so it was a mapping project. I had the concept and I took it to Banff and got some help to create it. So it lives online now. And I, I say that I loved Calgary since Eau Claire was a bus born and the Calgary Tower was husky. So if anybody's been around that long, <laughs> they might know what I'm talking about. So people contributed online. They, they marked where they wanted to, what they loved, and then created a, contributed an audio story. I took that idea then to the Forest Lawn community. I was the artist in residence there during the cultural capital year. And um, I, I rode a bike and interviewed people. I parked out front of Forest Laundry, uh, where I would capture people's stories. One of the things I learned there was I was bringing my white middle class idea where I had tons of success in the downtown of Calgary and the inner suburbs, but to come out to Forest Lawn where everybody loves their neighborhood, they are so busy, they've got three jobs, they're new immigrants, there's a whole bunch of barriers, they don't want to be recorded. So I did not get one successful story in terms of the funders, but I still, I still collected my money anyway as a, as a Calgary artist for the Calgary 2012. So I, I feel like you need to be nimble when you're working in various communities. I've worked with Eric Moscapettis and Mia um, Rushton. This is the Council of Community Conveyors. We knocked on doors looking like this. We knocked, we knocked on a door and we would convey messages from one neighbor to the next. So the first place we went to to test this out, we knocked on the door, we had our sash, we had our little clipboards. And I said, my name is Sharon, and I'm in your neighborhood today, and I'm collecting stories that I can give your neighbor, or a message, or something you want to tell your neighbor. And the guy that was there at the door looked at us. He had a really grumpy face, and he suddenly lit up and said, yeah, yeah, you can tell my neighbor that his landlord's an asshole. <laughs> and, and so we were like secretly going, oh, yes, yes, this is going to work. This is going to work. So we go to the neighbor, we knock on the door, we say, your neighbor, Pierre, my name is Sharon, the, the, the little spiel. And your neighbor Pierre says that your landlord's an asshole. And the guy goes, yes, I know. I've been trying to work with it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and we collected the stories, and then it was put into um, a gallery. So again, the spiral. Um, some of what I really believe in is that this connectedness that we're creating here today is also... Um, it, it's also going to be something that will be taken out into the community as well. So a couple of things I want to say here too is um, to supplement my art practice, I have jobs. Um, I worked full time and did my art practice on the side. Um, so what I just showed you is some of the work that I've initiated, collaborated on in community, about community. What's really important to me is justice, social justice based art practice. And I've shown you some of those examples of where art and activism can intersect. I really believe that art has the power to transform the world when it makes us laugh or to ponder, to smile or to cringe. When we experience art, we can just be. Um, one of the things I also want to mention here is, uh, I always say this when I go to talks, but it seems to be even more important now than ever, get to know your public art sculptures. If I can name off a couple of hockey players 
you guys can name the names of some of the public art. And I probably don't need to say that in this crowd, but did you know that the head is called Wonderland? And that it's the, um, the um, that's the bell. Stop. <laughs> um, it's, it's by an artist named Jane. Uh, how do I say it? James Plenza. You see, I need to learn this myself. So we really need to be advocates for public art in our communities. Um, so I worked for Joe Cece at City Hall. I worked at City Hall for 17 years, and I got tons of complaints about litter around the drop-in center. And there's nothing you can really do about it, but we got together with the drop-in center and the, and the clients that live there and the staff that live there, and every Sunday we picked up litter. And I tell you, that's the most gratifying thing you can ever do. So pick up litter. If that's not compassionate, I don't know what is. Pick, oh, and then <laughs> I was able to get politicians to go swimming. This is the Forest Lawn Outdoor Pool. And the three orders of government were, uh, were always passing the buck around the issues in Ward 9, which have to do with prostitution, drug-involved youth, that sort of thing. So I would get them swimming. And so, I don't need to point out who they are. I better move that on before somebody takes a picture. Uh, <laughs> One piece of advice after 17 years of working at City Hall, wasn't all with Joe Cece, I also worked for Bev Longstaff in Ward 7, pick up the telephone. Don't email your members of council, get to know them as a person. Another piece of advice that I suggest to people is knock on doors. Does anybody know where this is? It's inside the Freemasons Hall. If you ever want to rent it, it's available for rent. Knock on the door, tell Viola I sent you. I put on a really wicked, wild, party there. Uh, bring your heroes to town. Um, Astrid Haddad came here because I brought her the Yes Men. Uh, Judy Chicago also helped with the project. So don't think that those people are out of your reach. I'm really, uh, the earth and planet is really important to me. This was the earth um, installation that was during the G8 here. It sat in someone's yard for 10 or 12 years. They gave it to me, this giant big ball. And I um, it, put it into the womb. I call it the womb of the old Y building. Uh, if anyone's been there, there's a center space that's unused. So we lifted this giant bugger up onto the roof and lowered it down. And you know what happened? We are right attached to the Boys and Girls Club next door. And they never thought about that space that was just empty in there. And they put in a climbing wall. So it's, it's I just... I think that's a great thing. We were upset that we had to move our planet again, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so again, um, some of the advice I suggested are, is here. There's um, some things to think about is that you all have currency, build on that currency over, over your decades, and then you're able to do projects that may be a little bit outside of the realm. I also suggest people to join boards. Arts organizations usually need a board. Um, and just show up. So thank you for showing up. I'm just going to go to this is Equinox Vigil. And I'm going to change the tone here a little bit. Um, these slides are just going to go through, and I'm going to talk. Um, but I want to I sort of slow me down and slow you down and maybe get you into the space. Um, because part of what I do is create space for people. Now, I hate it when people ask me to do this. So if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But we're going to talk about death. We're going to talk about the cemetery. We're going to talk about creating a beautiful space to remember our dead. So for me, what I would like, I'm going to do is I'm going to rub my hands together and get all this energy, all this thinking, and I'm going to think about my dead people, and then rub all that energy. And I'm just going to hold it to my face. Thank you. So I, I don't want to make it all somber and sad, because the event is not all somber and sad. But we do create a sanctuary for tender feelings. Um, what I, I can give you are hankies, just in case. And these hankies were made by my mom out of my dad's. So if you want to take one and pass it along. Oh, here, I'll let you. Um, So the 20, 30 years of relationship building and building that personal capital um, allowed me to bring an event to the cemetery. 
Um, Equinox Vigil is a free, family-friendly event to honor the deceased in creative and meaningful ways. I feel deeply honored to help Calgarians create new traditions of remembrance and reflection with this project, and I plan to make it continue in the future. I believe I'm providing a public service by creating an appropriate event in a civic space. That becomes a tradition, a comfort. People know what you are, they are walking into. I'm trying to normalize the universality of death. We have a complicated relationship with death. And what I do is I invite local artists and some national artists to install shrines and artworks in Calgary's historic Union Cemetery. And then Calgarians of all ages are invited to attend and add personal messages or mementos to the shrines, craft memorial tributes with the help of professional artists, or simply join for an evening of respectful reflection and remembering. The event is, open, is an open invitation to individuals of every possible age, culture, faith, or absence of faith. The result is a beautiful, multidisciplinary, collaborative, participatory, enchanted, and unforgettable. This event has been unfolding since 2006, where I was inspired by a presentation, much like this one, by Paula Jardine at the Victoria, the City of Victoria Arts and Activism Symposium. She talked about being the artist in residence in Vancouver Cemetery, and I was immediately motivated to bring a similar event to Calgary. That was 2006. So she is still doing her event in Vancouver. I mentored with Paula and her collaborator, Marina Sizzarto, in 2010 in Vancouver, and then developed the Equinox Vigil for Calgary in 2012. I want to say here that the city was very courageous um, to give me the cemetery. There's still lots of uh, permits and lots of rules, um, but it took a, about two years to convince the city to let me have this event. I do this event in my father's name. I conduct this work in his name. I had the privilege of being with him and my mother when he drew his last breath. That was 20 years ago. It was in our family home, in their wedding bed, and in his dying bed. I was changed forever to witness this reciprocal, it's reciprocal at the end of his life as he witnessed mine at the beginning. The project is also um, part of a revival of the role of the urban cemetery in the lives of our increasingly secular uh, community and multicultural community. So for me, um, I, I um, felt like I didn't have something to hold me after my dad died. But lots of times when someone dies, if we have a strong cultural or religious structure to, to guide our actions, we know what to do what prayers to say, what songs to sing, what to say, how to behave. We don't have to think about it because it's prescribed. It carries us in its hands. When faced with death close to me, I feel slightly cast adrift and let down by what exists as options for a me meaningful funeral. The Night of All Souls, that's the Vancouver event, grew out of work we were trying to do to reclaim traditions that our, our, our own ancestors seem to have forgotten to pass on to us. We may not live in the village where our ancestors are buried, but the human impulse to remember the dead as a way of keeping them in our lives is still there. It seems to us as artists that we have an important role in, in that sacred life of our increasingly secular society, that even if someone is not religious, it doesn't mean they don't have spiritual needs. In many cultures around the world, the days at the end of October and the beginning of November are considered an important time for honoring the dead in our lives. I call our event a Calgary-style day of the dead. The change of the seasons, it's held in, near the equinox, the plants going dormant, and sometimes we begin a time of retrospective retrospection in the dark winter months. The biggest gift of the equinox vigil, I think, is the social aspect. Except at funerals or memorials, we do not invite conversation about death and, it's, and, the, and the presence of death in our lives. At this event, we are surrounded by people who, simply by being present, have acknowledged that they share that experience. People create memorial tributes, write messages or names, and we can see that we are not alone. We inspire each other with our words and with the beauty of our creations. It is a very supportive environment, not somber, but definitely caring and gentle. We create a village for you. It's a space that invokes the sacred and a place to remember the mystery that is life and death. We invite meaningful ways to connect with our dead. 
Sue Goyette, who was last year's visiting poet from Halifax, she reminded me that this is activist work. We are reviving old traditions, and that, makes the ten that takes the tenacity of an activist. The compassion of holding the space is a kind of activism because it invites us to be vulnerable and open-hearted in all our community. And so often these days we feel alone and unable to experience our vulnerability, that we so rarely allow ourselves to be vulnerable. To have this kind of experience in a community, singular and yet in company, also feels righteous. It creates a ritual, one that we we're bereft of culturally, that helps us understand our grief and loss and that we are not alone. I'm so pleased to see families coming to Equinox Vigil. It has now become an annual tradition for many. In particular, these young families who embrace the event as an opportunity for storytelling about family members who have died and to introduce the subject of mortality to, to their children. They've been coming year after year right from the beginning, so it's really heartwarming to see that. Colorful shrines and art installations um, are created by professional artists form the heart of the Equinox Vigil experience. Artists know the need for pageantry and subtlety. They understand form and color and beginning and middle and end. They create art in place. These artworks come alive through your participation. By performing simple acts like adding personal mementos to shrines or joining a lantern procession, each of you at Equinox Vigil becomes a community drawing close to mourn our deceased through art and ritual. And let's begin our evening together, is what I say at the beginning of our, our event, with artists and leading the way into the graveyard. So it's an artist-led event. I take that very literally, and we, we go up. Um, and uh, we're in, right in the Union Cemetery. Lots of you probably know that as Cemetery Hill by the stampede there. Um, so I, I just want to um, finish by saying that uh, I learned uh, I got some really good advice in Tucson, uh, where I was invited to come. It's a, they have an event there uh, similar to, they're very close to Mexico, so they have 150,000 people that get on the streets for, for a uh, procession to honor their dead. And um, I was invited there to do a digital shrine, which is a contribution that I made to Equinox Vigil. And um, I said to her that I feel like a vessel. I'm always hearing uh, stories and um, feeling people's um, death uh, relationships. But she said, no, you're a conduit. Let it go through you. You're a conduit. So I'm a conduit with a, a video on my back, so hopefully I won't get electrocuted. Um, and I'll just leave you with a couple of things. I'm around. You can ask me some questions. Um, but we do have a fun. The Equinox Vigil is funded uh, prim primarily uh, by donors like you. We have an event on right now, a fundraising event called the Ungala. That means you don't go anywhere. You don't buy a silent auction item. You don't get a babysitter or a new dress. You stay home. You give me the money instead. Uh, and we're looking for volunteers and marigolds. <laughs> so we put a lot of fresh flowers on the site. So I'll just end there.